Mr. President, for the position of Chairman EFCC, to introduce yourself and tell the Senate about your pedigree, and thereafter, the floor will be open to Senators to ask you questions. JCON, always just uh, coming to take his seat. This Deputy President of the Senate, most uh, also distinguished Senator Jibri Barrow, CON, the leaders of the Senate, permit me to please recognize the leader, Senator Okoyemi Bamidele, who happens to also be a Senate, this is a Senator representing my state. Permit me also to specially recognize Senator Yemi Adaramudu from uh, Ekiti South, who happens to be my own Senate, Senator from Ekiti South. Permit me to also recognize Senator Cyril, who also uh, is from Ekiti North Senatorial District, Fashui, Senator Cyril Fashui, distinguished. The very distinguished Senate of the Federal Senators of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I stand before you today as a nominee of the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Ashiwa Jubola Ahmed Tinubu, the father of the nation, to be screened and confirmed, if you so desire, as the Executive Chairman of Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. I'd like to especially thank and appreciate the President for finding me worthy of this uh, nomination. I also like to put on record that this uh, Arnold Chambers, Chambers had cause to screen me in 2018 as the secretary nominee for Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, and I was duly confirmed in 2018 by this Arlo Chambers. Uh, so this is making, this, making me the second time of appearing before you, and I believe that the same gesture that was extended then will so also be extended. Having said that, my name is Ola Nikpeko Lukoyede. I was born on the 14th of October, 1969, in Ikero Ekiti, Ekiti State, southwest region of Nigeria. I started my education pursuit in 1974 at St. Luke's Primary School. From there, moved on to Annunciation College, both in Ikero Ekiti. Uh, from there, I had a stint for my art. College of Basic and Remedial Studies in Akure, where I had my A-levels. From there, I proceeded to University of Lagos, where I, had a, uh, I ran a program in law, diploma in law. From there, I moved to Lagos State University, where I graduated with LLB. From there, went to the Nigerian Law School, where I was called to uh, the bar. By way of executive education, I, I had cause to be, I'm also an alumnus of uh, uh, Harvard Kennedy School, University of Harvard, and also Oxford, University of Oxford in UK, where I had uh, an executive uh, education program in public uh, corruption uh, management. My career started, I started my career way back in 1995, even before I went back to study law. Um, that was when I had my first experience as a fraud manager when I was employed by an international company to carry out fraud management. That was where I had my first training. And from there, I went back to school after I became a lawyer and called to bar. I was privileged to join an international company as well where I started my career as a compliance manager and also corporate intelligence uh, specialist. I, this job took me to about three continents of the world, and it gave me experience to interact with other key players in law enforcement around the world. Uh, by virtue of the job I did then, we, the I represented the company 
uh, to carry out uh, what we call compliance management uh, and regulatory compliance with foreign corrupt practices in the US and also bribery act in the UK, where we carry that consultancy job for all uh, international companies that are subject of those laws. And that gave me the opportunity of having an encounter with operative uh, FBI and the uh, serious force office in the UK. After my foray into that, I, was, uh, I had the opportunity of so for also working at the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. First of all, maybe at least for the knowledge of the House, Malam Nouni Badu, we met first in 2006, I think in, the, in Washington, D.C., where he, I presented a paper and he noticed me and he said, look, young man, what are you doing here? Why don't, let's, let's, let's go back home and, and I've, I've been I'm the chairman of Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, see how we can support our country. So he gave me the opportunity of working with him uh, as a, as a trainee, trainer and also as, a, as someone who rendered service in the area of prosecution support. And uh, after that, when he left, I went back to uh, private sector again and continue with my regulatory compliance work. And uh, <clears throat> as fate will have it, I also went back again to law enforcement when I was employed as the chief, as the, as the <clears throat> chief of staff uh, in 2016 to the executive chairman of Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Of course, as a chief of staff, you are like a shadow chairman. Most of the, you are like the clearing table for the chairman. And after that, I also became the secretary uh, in 2018 November. Uh, that is by way of my journey into uh, the profession of fraud management and regulatory compliance. When this uh, nomination came up, I quickly addressed my mind to the Aquilian task that this is going to place before not only me, but the entire country. And so that helped me to come up with three-pronged approach, which I call policy objectives. In one minute, I'm going to present it to you. I came with the first one, came up with the first one that has to do with focus. And these are the principles that will drive me and my colleagues, if I'm privileged to be confirmed in EFCC. Number one, what is the focus of an anti-corruption agency in a place like Nigeria? We need to redirect our focus. Section, four, section six of EFCC Act has given us what an anti-corruption agency should be doing. Number one, I believe we should focus on driving economic development. Number two, we must also create an atmosphere for transparency and accountability in running the government. And also number three, we must help as an anti-corruption agency to build the international image of this country. Because if you don't do that, there is no way you will endear foreign direct investment. So having put these three policy objectives together, something came to my mind. And I said, look, with this, how do we move forward? And I also came up with three posters that I'd like to share with you very quickly before I run off, and also present it before these uh, allo chambers, so that a lot of us can put minds together and see how we can move forward in Nigeria. Number one is the need for collective responsibility. We need to get to a point in Nigeria where we need to come together on the same page and believe that corruption is, is a canker worm to our development. We must come together and believe that financial crimes, the way it has overwhelmed our structure and systems in Nigeria, we can't move forward. Even if we are moving forward, it's going to be as a snail speed. And so where do we go from here? All of us come to, must come together. It's not just the work of the anti-corruption agencies. We must agree. And I say this, we, everybody is talking about we need to fight corruption, but I, I have come by virtue of my experience to notice that it has become more of rhetorics than showing the commitment. And that's why I'm standing before you today, if given the opportunity. The time has come for us to show commitment. What do I mean? For instance, 
if I have the opportunity tomorrow to perhaps investigate the most distinguished uh, president of the Senate, uh, not even that. Okay, let me use my senator, <laughs> Senator Senator Daramodul. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, distinguished senators, I noticed that my brothers on this side of the aisle are very excited that they should use the Senate president as an example. <laughs> so, um, the distinguished nominee, look to this side and pick anyone, Senator Aleru or anyone. <laughs> If, uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, so, so, so even Senator Ningi was a leader. Yeah, pick, pick any of them. Leave the Senate President for now. <laughs> now, the point I'm, I was trying to make is that if I should go after someone as uh, an agency, the moment you open the investigation, automatically you become the enemy of the person. Not only the enemy of that person, you become the enemy of all his friends. You become the enemy of all his acquaintances. You become the enemy of all his family members. You become the enemy of all his party members. You become the enemy of all his professional members. And that is the way we have been fighting. And, and if we have this attitude, we can move forward. We must, this, we must realize that this is bad and we must support the anti-corruption agency to call a spade a spade, no matter the relationship we have with such a person. And because even the, to the corrupt, the corrupt themselves don't even uh, enjoy a good living, standard of living. For example, somebody has stolen money in Nigeria, as it is today, and you bought a Rolls Royce. Where is the road, road to drive a Rolls Royce in Nigeria? You have stolen money, you build a mansion in your village or local government. Are you not, won't you be afraid to spend a night there? Where is the security? Now, if you look at this trajectory, you discover that it's a sort of, of, of financial crimes and corruption that we have, all of us collectively, uh, we, we've not really done much about. And, and I'm saying this with every sense of solidarity and every sense of patriotism, brother. So the time has come for us to, to call evil, evil. It doesn't matter whose resource is God. It doesn't matter who's benefiting from it. That's number one. So that must be collective responsibility. Number two, as I begin to round up, they, we must also, particularly for, the, for my colleagues in the anti-corruption you know, platform, the time has come for us to begin to look at more of prevention than enforcement. Enforcement is a very strong tool in our hand. We are going to apply it very seriously. But again, I discover that the incentives are there all around us in Nigeria. And I'll give you an example. You see an average level eight public servant who drives two cars, who builds a house. I mean, this is common knowledge. Everybody knows. Now, we ask ourselves a question. Is savings for 30 years, have we all through his service years, can they actually afford to buy this car? But the problem we have is just like the, the, you know, the proverbial monkey that was locked up in the cage, and you put a bunch of ripe banana in that cage, and you stand outside with a cane in your hand, one day, two days, three days, and you want the monkey not to eat the, the banana, and you lock the monkey there with cane in your hand outside the cage. One day, two days, three days. The monkey would think twice. What is the authority for gone here? If I eat this banana, I will survive. The worst will come is that this man will kill me. After so much, he will kill me. But if I am afraid to eat this banana, I will die. That, 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 is, that is where we have gotten to. That everybody wants to dip hands into the treachery and all of that. And the incentives 
for corruption is all over the place. So I will do more in the area of blocking the leakages. Because also in the course of my, of my carrying out study, fraud survey, I discovered that for you to, if you allow 10 naira to be stolen, you spend an average of between 3 naira 50 kobo and 4 naira 50 kobo to recover it. That is even if you are able to recover the 10 naira. But for you to prevent the stealing of 10 naira, you spend less than 1 naira. So which one is the more effective tool to fight corruption? Without downplaying the importance of enforcement, why can't we challenge more on prevention and let it begin with this Alo Chambers today? We, we, we discover that in Nigeria, we, there is nowhere to run to. So I want to plead with this Alo Chambers. That is what we call transactional credit system. If we continue to allow Nigerians to buy houses, cash, to buy cars, cash, we don't have a very effective credit system, a thousand EFCC, added to a million ICPC, will not do us any good. And that is the reality. We must create that atmosphere as lawmakers for people to have choices. Look, if I don't steal money, can I afford to train my, school, my children in school? Minimum standard. If I don't steal money, can I buy a car after I've worked for five years? If I don't steal money, can I at least put three bedroom bungalow in place after I've worked for 15, 20 years? An average Nigerian doesn't have a hope. When he has the opportunity, he will steal. And even if he doesn't have it, he will create one. And so you will not leave the law enforcement agencies and the corruption agencies to start running, running after them. Finally, Distinguished Senator Sir, I'd like to also for us to encourage our criminal justice system to work. We must, if we really want to fight corruption, anywhere the fight of corruption succeeds in the world, the substance is taken above technicalities. We must encourage our criminal justice system to Educate in such a way that max prosecution doesn't take more than five years. Max from the cost of first instance to Supreme Court. And I know these allocation bills can begin to work on that very seriously. And so if we make our criminal justice system work, you will see more of what the anti corruption agencies are doing. And it will be better for all of us. On this note, I'd like to thank you very much. And I want to leave you with this. I did a survey between 2018 and 2020 of 50 entities in Nigeria, 50 entities, both human and corporate entities, between 2018 and 2020. And I picked just one scheme, one species of fraud, which is called contract and procurement fraud. And I discovered that between 2018 and 2020, three years, Nigeria lost 2.9 trillion, 2.9 trillion. Now, when I put my figures together, I discovered that this money, if we had saved, if we had prevented it, would have given us 1,000 kilometers of roads. In addition to that, we would have built close to 200 standard schools, tertiary institutions. In addition to that, we would have educated about 6,000 children from primary to tertiary levels at 16 million per child would have delivered 20,000 units of three-bedroom houses across the country, and even more. Would have given us a world-class teaching hospital in each of the 36 states of the Federation. This is where we are coming from. This is where we are. Where we are going to go depends on the decision we take this afternoon. Thank you very much. It's left to the distinguished senators to ask questions, but please do not clap. Because the same way you are clapping, if you don't answer the question well, you also boo. So do not boo. Yes, let's start from the leadership. The civil Senator Ndube. Senator Ndube, you have the floor. As chair and distinguished colleagues, let me start by congratulating you being a person that I know, not much, but closely, 
You worked with Magu when you were consulting, and you also worked as his chief of staff. Later, you became a secretary, and now a pastor. I don't know when you became a pastor, but along the way. Now, I have two questions. But before I do that, I want to make some small clarification as the leadership on your behalf. This much talked about section 2.1 is being misinterpreted. In the sense that it is talking about a certain qualification or equivalent. Looking at the CV of the person standing before us, as I said, he has been in the system for 10 years now or in the AFCC and even being the secretary. I don't think there will be any other equivalence of experience than that. So that should settle the issue of section 2.1. My question, actually, is that the, the institutions responsible for fighting corruption includes the NI, NFIU, NFIU, the FATF is, you are a member, or the EFCC is a member, even though it has no statutory body. The EFCC itself and the ICPC, the DSS, looking at what they are doing now, and the police, of course, the CID. And when I looked at the laws establishing or detailing the responsibilities of this organization, I find it so many places conflicting. The NFIU was under your organization when you were there. And you are also there when it was removed. And you are also there when an act establishing it as an independent agency was passed by the National Assembly. As I was saying, the responsibility or even the law establishing your agency and that of NFIU, which is now domiciled in Central Bank, in the section six and seven, you are supposed to be working also with the central bank. But NFIU was under the, and as I said, from what you do, there are conflicts. So that takes me to my first question. The purpose or the reason why EFCC was established in 2002 during the government of Obasanjo was because Nigeria was excluded for non-compliance as one of the 23 countries that are non-compliant. You know that better than myself. Now that we are in there, and if NFIU is established with these responsibilities, which was in the EFCC Establishment Act, don't you see conflict there? That is one. Secondly, now takes me to the, my second question. I see the powers you have in section six and seven. The silent one there is the most important. And that is the unexplained wealth order. I'm happy you have talked about being preventive instead of being reactive. Every time I have a problem with anybody, I'll just write a petition to EFCC, especially we politicians. Before you know, EFCC will call the reporters before you arrive. And they paint you black or even red because that's your color. Before you get out of that, your children, your family, 
are embarrassed. We got a situation where when we are campaigning for a position, I won't mention, the person we are comp 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 campaigning for was, a, was invited to AFCC on a frivolous uh, this, a, a matter. And it was in the papers. Now, the second question which I ask is that this now gives us the chance. You are saying that we should cooperate. We promise you that we will cooperate with the, uh, your agency, if confirmed, to take more preventive actions. The countries that are leading the NFIU, that is Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, UK, USA, and even Canada and Zimbabwe, you know, have the unexplained wealth order. And that is not conviction. If you find Roy, Roy, Rolls Royce in, uh, Roy, Roy Royce, you call it, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, leader's house. You mean minority leader's house? Or, or, minority or let leader. me use example of myself. Or minority leader. Why are you insisting on minority leader? Okay, minority leader. Now you have a cause to quietly invite him and find out how or where did he get the money to buy Rolls Royce. And if he explains to you, that is the end of the matter. If he cannot explain to you, you quietly take the, the that is the forfeiture you talk about. But instead, as I was doing my research before you came in, in 2022, you left in August this year, isn't it? In 2022, you are flagging over 200, is it 2,000 something convictions? But all is minor, minor crime that if you add up, does not total to one crime, financial crime committed by an individual which I will not mention. And then the EFCC allowed him to go home on a self-recognition. All they could do was get into one year now. All you could do, or you, or you, 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 you could do, was to recover 10% of that money. What will you do? Pastor, as God-fearing person. These are the two questions. Thank you. Because his heart was very troubled when he came in. The example you gave is good that you use the minority leader on that Rolls Royce. <laughs> so please, any other person that is speaking, point at this side. Okay. Uh, and if, you, if you have an unexplained aeroplane, Point at this uh, this uh, this uh, the, uh, the people on this side have no business with Rolls Royce and plane. I would like to pause there. You have the questions. You have the questions. Let me invite the secretary to introduce himself so that any of them can answer the questions. Uh, uh, Senator Gouin, let somebody put a seat next to the chairman. Chairman, so you can take the floor again. You have rested now, so you can faint. So take the floor. Yes, any, any further question? I think um, by your designation, you are supposed to fight economic and financial crimes to create accountability and transparency in governance and in all sectors of the economy. I have a small story, Mr. President. I was once a local government chairman and somebody wrote a frivolous petition against me. Your people or the commission without any investigation, detained me for several days. After investigation, I was released, and it was close to an election time. 
So I understood at the end of the day that the petition was just meant to make me lose the next election. But the question I have is that, don't you think that if a petition is written on someone for financial or economic crime, you should do your due diligence investigation before inviting and detaining the person. Because otherwise, you will end up detaining innocent people. And at the end of your investigation, you find out that the person has not committed the crime. Then what should the person do? Should he also sue you for detaining him you know, unlawfully? So my own question is that, are you supposed to just invite and detain a person on a petition from anybody? Or you must have concrete evidence that that crime have actually been you know, committed. Number two, at uh, least the hunter becomes the hunted. The EFCC is not also free of financial crime. I heard you say that um, there's that possibility if you are allowed to investigate the Senate president. So who will investigate this, the EFCC, sir? The House. the House. So we also have the capacity to investigate you. So as you do your work, we want to, I, I want to advise that the EFCC should not be used as an instrument to fight political opponent. Because we have seen this clearly, that if you don't like my face, or if I'm contesting an election, for example, against the Senate president, and uh, because of his status, you may decide to well into political issues instead of find, fighting political uh, economic crimes. And therefore, you take side. For example, this side of the divide, they are the ones in government now. And if I'm running an election with any one of them, they can use you. You have to tell this Senate that you will be immune of being used by any political high-level person to fight innocent Nigerians or label innocent financial crimes against them to deter them from achieving their rights to contest elections. He said not only elections, any other thing. So please, because the only way you can prove to us that you are hired to fight commercial, uh, sorry, um, economic crimes is for us to see that transparency in you. It's for us to see that you are not being used by somebody. Tell us, assuming President Bola Ahmed Tinubu will say today, go and investigate, assuming but not considering. Go and investigate so such a person, and you know that the person is not guilty. Even if he's guilty, will you follow the due diligence of the law to do that investigation? Finally, I was doing it, sir. Finally, is there no synergy between the EFCC and the ICPC? Because in my own instance, I was investigated on the same issues by these two agencies. Is there no synergy that if EFCC is investigating Mr. A on crime ABC, ICPC should not be doing the same thing on the same grounds or the same charges. Thank you. And they can mention their vision. We will continue to interact with them. We will re-invite them because we are the ones who are citing them. And we have to do our job. You are aware that EFCC has a lot of questions to answer. And so this Senate in future intends also to look into the activities of EFCC. Am I right? You are talking about yourself. It means that the person who wrote a petition against you when you were a local government chairman was not a high-profile person. That is why you were not even invited by DSS. That is why you were not invited by the IG. 
But what about where you have invitation to appear before DSS, appear before the IG, appear before the ICPC, appear before the EFCC, and it's all organized? How do you explain 98 petitions written against one human being, and none of them has any merit? So he has, what you are indirectly asking him is how would he treat frivolous petitions against politically exposed persons? Which of some, um, um, uh, all those investigations also cost money, taxpayers' monies. At the end, you don't find anything against that person, and the country has lost a lot of money. So these things are there. So, Chairman, and start work if you are approved. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, distinguished Senate President. Um, I'd like to address the question posed by distinguished Senator Dume. Um, as regards the NFIU, FATF, and uh, the establishment of NFIU, rather. Now, those provisions you refer to, sir, in EFCC are, that are still there, that um, also similar to what NFIU is doing, those provisions are being repealed automatically by uh, the enactment of the NFIU Act. But again, when it comes to the issue of money laundering and all that, there, there is no way we can rule out the possibility of areas of overlap. There is no way. But specifically, when it comes to the statutory function of NFIU, uh, all those relevant provisions in EFCC Act have been repealed by the virtue of the, of the establishment of uh, the uh, NFIU and the enactment of the NFIU Act. Now, sir, you also ask questions about uh, unexplained wealth order. You try to relate it to media trial, but all what I'm going to say is that uh, the mandate given by EFCC, I mean, the mandate given to EFCC was given to EFCC by law. Any attempt to do anything outside that mandate is going to be deemed as also violating the provision of the law. Uh, so I, if I have given the opportunity, I stand before you. I was also an officer in the Temple of Justice. We are going to do our work diligently with utmost respect to the provisions of the law. You can't fight anti-corruption uh, successfully without respect to the provisions of the law. I make that pledge before you, sir. Now, the distinguished senator from Plato, I didn't get in name very well, I'm sorry about that. Uh, senator Simon, si thank you, sir. Distinguished Senator Simon. My not really, thank you, sir. Now, you raised the issue of due diligence before invitation and all of that. Now, one of the, a professional investigator will tell you that before you can invite anyone. At the point of invitation, you, have, you must have gathered, you must have done 90% of your work. I mean, a thorough investigation, to, investigators should know that. That is what we call predication in investigation. When you receive a petition, you look at it, you carry out your preliminary investigation. And when you are able, when having established predication, then you can now probably begin to look into other areas. And if now you must bring in the person, that will almost be the last lap of investigation. And I want to also uh, say that there could be exceptions to that rule of predication as well. For example, if you know that the person may escape out of jurisdiction, and that could vitiate the process of investigation, and you need to bring in this, I mean, this person to, I mean, for, to make treatment and all of that, uh, then perhaps it may be expedient for you to put some certain processes in place and uh, just to ensure that the person does not escape because you have already started your investigation. Now, that is an exception to the rule, but the general application is that of predication. You must have done your work. This is, this is financial crime investigation. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not, mm, it's not combatant matter. It's, it's not, uh, you know, it's not war. Uh, what you need is, your, is the brain and technology. Uh, we will get to a point uh, that at a press of a button, we can look at the financial you know, activities of everybody. So that makes the job easier for you. So you don't even have to start running after people carrying AK-49, you know, 
are hounding people all over the place. That's not the best way to investigate financial crimes. That's why we call it white collar crimes. Now, we also, uh, the, the Chief Senator also raised the issue of uh, political opponents. I'd like to submit, sir, with every sense of commitment to duty. This issue of, you know, investigating political opponents is neither here nor there. There are two salient questions that must be asked and answered. Number one, has the person committed crime? Has he committed financial crimes? If he has, then I will have cause to investigate him. Whether if you are in the ruling party, if you dip your hands into what you are not supposed to dip your hands into, you will be called to question. Well, you are in the opposition, you, you swallow some paper that will not digest, you will also be called to answer questions. So the, the, the mandate that the law gives us, or gives EFCC, did not discriminate. And the question is, OK, of course, there is no way you will not pick people who have, I mean, find people who have committed crime and all of that, I mean, financial crimes. This is where equity and justice comes in. So you will not be seen as chasing a particular section or, you know, send that, you know, signal across to people that you are always chasing a particular set of people. And that's where we are going to balance the whole thing. That's why what I have to say about that. So we are going to be guided strictly by our mandate. And finally, the synergy between FCC and ICPC. Some years ago, I was privy to developing an MOU between the FCC and ICPC to the extent that we don't want to begin to do things that at the end of the day will end up in double jeopardy. Uh, so I remember then the acting executive chairman and the uh, chairman of ICPC, including myself and the secretary of ICPC, we had a couple of meetings. And uh, we developed that MOU, but I'm not sure that MOU has been executed. Now, if I'm given the opportunity to be confirmed, one of the first things I'm going to do is to ensure that that MOU is executed so that that will form an, I mean, a kind of working relationship between ICPC and EFC so that we'll be able to, look, if, if ICPC is investigating someone using Nigerian taxpayers' money, why should I dissipate energy and resources to investigate if perhaps it's the same, the facts are similar? I don't think that is, that is going to be the interest of uh, uh, you know, of the nation. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say about the questions. Will you subscribe to a major of ICPC and EFCC in order not to uh, continue with this duplicity? That's one. Yes, because if you do so, if you, if, if, uh, the, the, the hollow chambers of both houses can look at that to avoid double uh, jeopardy. Uh, that's one, it will be necessary to look at the possibility of merging the two uh, so that we don't continue with uh, hounding Nigerians. And then, um, Senator, Senator Aleru. <coughs> Distinguished colleagues, my name is Mohammed Adam Aleru. I represent KB Central. Uh, Mr. Nomini, let me congratulate you once more. I have a very simple question for you. Most of the investigations are concentrated on government and governmental agencies. You hardly hear of investigations going on in financial institutions. Until recently, when uh, the CBN came into such a light. And we know very well that uh, Crimes are committed more in the banking sector or in the private sector. I will give you an example. I happen to be in the Banking and Financial Institutions Committee, and um, we had oversight you know, visit on AMCOM. And they told us that uh, they have well over 5 trillion naira which is in the hands of very few Nigerians. Uh, uh, actually, only 22, yes, only 22 people. And this is a very big financial crime. Most of it is abuse of office by uh, corporate individuals. 
And some of these individuals are highly pleased. EFCC is doing investigation on them. And AMCON has been expecting to recover this money from these 22 individuals. Five trillion naira is capital budget of Nigeria of 2021-2022. And you will just read a piece of paper what two trillion naira can do for Nigeria. Now, these five individuals are having more than 20, are having more than five trillion naira. And nothing is being done on them. But you hear of EFCC arresting a governor for misappropriating 200 million naira. Arresting the governor for misappropriating 500 million naira. While there are individuals that are holding this five trillion naira, you are doing nothing about it. Nigerians want to know what will you do to recover this money. And most of this money is backed by a guarantee. Nothing is being done to recover this money by using the guarantee. Why are you silent on that? Why is EFCC silent on that? We want to know what we will do to recover this money. This is taxpayer money. Uh, at a particular time, the governor of Central Bank had to release well over 1.5 trillion naira to recapitalize the bank because of serious misappropriation, serious corruption going on. And up to now, this money has not been recovered. So we would like to know your approach to this. Thank you, Mr. President. Chairman nominee, the reality is that I think that EFCC has engaged more on sensation than on real investigation. Like uh, the minority leader pointed out, it was a local government chairman, an election was coming. For me, I've had my own share, where even a letter informing EFCC that I would not be able to come on a frivolous petition was released by the office of the chairman of EFCC to Sahara reporters. You see the chairman stamp on it. He released it to Sahara reporters just to embarrass me because of 2023 election. But to the glory of God, I surmounted it, I'm here. You know, so, so for me, I don't think we should waste time with EFCC. We need to take a thorough look at EFCC and look at whether the act setting up the EFCC even allows them to function because there's too much discretion. I don't see how the EFCC will go and arrest uh, a, a, a former governor and come through the rooftop as if they are taking uh, Pablo Escobar <laughs> of, uh, of uh, yeah, it, it, but it happened. It happened to Rocha Zokorocha. They came through the roof. They broke through the POP. And it was, it, was, it, was, it was calling life. Nigerians were, the whole world watched. They removed the roof, went through the POP, broke it down, and they were going down with guns. Is that EFCC? And, you, and for you, that is investigation. So what do you, I, would, I would like to hear from you would be what will you do differently? Because outside this country, sometimes they can follow somebody for five to 10 years until they establish evidence before they invite that person. But they keep embarrassing people's children, traumatizing the children, stigmatizing people because they had the opportunity to be in public office. And even within the FCC, properties that you recover, money you recover, are stolen. People's, people's uh, properties that are supposed to be in your care are stolen and sold out at ridiculous prices. Properties worth five billion are sold for three hundred naira because it is EFCC. So for me, I don't, I don't, I don't. I, EFCC, I have my own opinion about EFCC. So I welcome you, Chairman. So I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to comment on EFCC, but I know that. No, <laughs> I know that this this uh, hollow chamber, this hollow chamber has the governor, and we have the right to review the law, setting up EFCC for proper functionality and effectiveness. 
Am I speaking the minds of senators? Yes. Senator Abbas, close it. I was a member of course one of EFCC. And even senior to the former chairman of EFCC. About my boss is here, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Hamajoda. Hamajoda was my boss, but I came before him into FCC. But we worked together as cashier while he was the auditor of the commission. He's a straightforward person. He doesn't tolerate illegality, which Senator uh, Nkombo will attest to that, because he worked under him. And be the old, with all the shortcomings of EFCC, Mr. Senator President, I'm in line with what you have said, to strengthen the commission by changing the status of, I mean, the status of EFCC. Uh, with this, I want to urge my fellow colleagues, distinguished senators, uh, to allow the two gentlemen to take a bow and leave because a lot have been said, a, a lot of questions have been asked. Uh, we should allow them to take their bow and take the leave of the chamber. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, is that the mood of the chambers? Yes. 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 Uh, the chairman, just to mention that I've actually seen that you have appeared before the Senate before and you were cleared. You were cleared uh, on the 28th day of uh, November 2018 as Secretary of the EFCC. You didn't mention that, so that was important. It means that this salo chamber had already scrutinized you and given you a clean bill of health. And then you served as Secretary of the EFCC after the clearance by the Senate. You should have told us, we wouldn't have wasted so much time. Move forward, come forward and take a bow. You can take leave of the Senate.